people in. Anyway, so again, I'm David Brown with Berkeley Nucleonics, and thank you for your time today uh, to spend with us. We're, uh, we're going to have a webinar presentation and do show some pulse power measurements. I'm joined by Junior Che, who's our product uh, manager for our RF microwave line, uh, which is a very fast growing area for our company. And also Orwell Hawkins, who's the VP of marketing and sales and uh, from Ladybug Technologies, which is also a fast growing and exciting uh, power sensor company, which uh, has some unique products to offer. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Junior uh, to run the webinar. Thank you, Junior. Thank you, David. Uh, yes, uh, welcome everyone uh, to our uh, webinar series. Uh, and, and also uh, very excited to have Orwell Hawkins with us here as well, a uh, great partner of ours. And as you may already know, uh, our, um, our products uh, complement each other very well, you know, with signal sources and power meters. So it only made sense to uh, 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 put together a webinar for you today. Now, before I get into our presentation, uh, I'd like to just uh, go over the overview of the webcast in itself. Uh, this webcast will be recorded and a link will be emailed to all of our attendees. Uh, all of the participants will be muted until the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, but you're more than welcome to type in any question in the chat box. Uh, either it should be on your uh, um, on your left or your right on the uh, bottom half of your screen. Um, and again, you're, you're more than welcome to type in any question as the presentation goes on and at the end, uh, we will definitely uh, address that question. Uh, you may want to expand your presentation window. Uh, if you look at the top right hand corner next to the ID number, uh, there are four arrows um, um, you know, pointing outwards. If you click that, that will get you into full screen and you can always minimize back by uh, hitting your escape button on your keyboard. Uh, the chat box is not private, so uh, please keep that in mind as well. Everyone will see your questions or comments, uh, maybe even a joke. Uh, so please be mindful of that. And this presentation is not classified, so you're more than welcome to forward it to any of your colleagues, your friends, uh, anyone you feel may benefit uh, from this presentation. So uh, moving on. I wanted to just quickly touch on our companies. You know, as David mentioned earlier, you know, Berkeley Nucleonics, we have been in business since 1963. Uh, we started off with uh, pulse generators for the nuclear uh, industry. Uh, and today, now we have three divisions of our company. You know, RF microwave, obviously, uh, test and measurement with our pulse generators, digital delay generators. You may have heard of our uh, model 575 or 577. Uh, and then our nuclear division, you know, we have full solutions all across the range from, you know, personal radiation detectors, isotope identifiers, and all the way up to uh, custom scintillation detectors. And again, Ladybug, you know, very excited, very proud to be partnered with them as well. Uh, they were founded in 2004 by Richard Hawkins, who is uh, Orwell's younger brother, uh, and Mr. John Sigler. Uh, they've made some great strides over the years as well, now offering true RMS sensors going up to 50 gigs in a very, very small package, uh, able to tackle all types of uh, power measurements, you know, peak pulse and average, wideband pulse profiling. I mean, the list goes on. And we will give uh, Orwell an opportunity to uh, um, speak more about their capabilities uh, later on this presentation before he uh, performs his demonstration. Uh, one quick uh, uh, tidbit here about our worldwide network of sales representatives. Uh, as you can see on the on the globe map there, uh, we pretty much have almost every continent covered. So wherever you are located, and uh, thank you for your our overseas attendees uh, joining us today. Uh, most likely in your location, we will have a local representative that can provide uh, support, uh, pricing, uh, answer any questions uh, on our behalf. And if you look at the U.S. map, uh, you'll also see that uh, we have the whole country covered from the East Coast to the West Coast, uh, Midwest, uh, the South. Again, wherever you're located, uh, we most likely have a local representative that will be able to support you. So uh, let's dive in. Uh, let's go over the agenda. Uh, basically, today's topic is radar. And I will be going over the basics, you know, what is radar, uh, the types of radar, 
Um, and then our signal sources, of course, and you know, how they can be of solutions in different types of radar applications and testing. And we will definitely be focusing on the modulation portion as that is very important in radar. And then uh, Orwell will uh, take over and uh, give us uh, his thoughts on power measurements and the importance. And of course, uh, uh, an overview of Ladybug and their capabilities and offerings. And finally, uh, a great demonstration of some uh, low level RF power measurements and burst measurements. And at the end, we'll finally have our Q&A session. Uh, again, you can always type in uh, your questions in the chat box, but at the end, uh, if you would like to join us for a discussion, uh, we're happy to unmute your mic and you can maybe even unlock your camera if you wanted to show yourself and uh, join us uh, with, with our windows here and, and ask us any questions. Again, we're happy to uh, support you. So uh, let us dive right in. First question is, what is radar? Uh, many of you may already know the acronym, you know, Radio Detection and Ranging System. So this is basically an electronic electromagnetic system used to detect the location and distance of an object by monitoring the echo or reflected signal. You know, very basic. And if you look at the, uh, the simple image right above, uh, this is, uh, you know, just a basic uh, visual on how a, a basic radar system will work. You have your transmitter and receiver and a duplexer in between that will choose, you know, whether to transmit or receive from the antenna. As you can see, the transmitting signal will go towards the object, in this case, a uh, unidentified flying object. That uh, uh, signal will then be reflected. Uh, will be returning back to you as an echo signal. That same antenna will receive that signal, be sent to the receiver, and that's where your analyzation uh, can happen to determine that location and distance. So let us talk about the two basic uh, types of radar uh, systems. The first is the basic pulse radar. Uh, basically what that is, you're sending pulses toward the target object, you know, with the uh, your preferred uh, rep rate, your pulse width, uh, you know, those type of parameters that will determine the type of, uh, of range and uh, resolution that you can uh, receive. Uh, and then you would wait for that uh, signal to, to uh, come back to you uh, before you send another pulse. Uh, so in with this uh, system, the main uh, goal is to determine the range or the distance of that object in yourself or as the observer. In order to do this, uh, that returning signal will be analyzed and the intervals between the pulses, that's where you will do the measurements to figure out uh, exactly what the range is of that object. So uh, I must mention for the basic pulse radar system, uh, it is a non-coherent because the phase is random from pulse to pulse. Uh, I will get into why that is important later on, but uh, basically for phase noise and phase noise measurements, coherency is, is quite important. Now, the main application uh, for pulse radar is for long range air surveillance uh, from the ground. So for example, if you are uh, searching for an aircraft uh, in the sky um, using a pulse radar, will help you determine, you know, the distance of that uh, the aircraft in the direction it is traveling. Now, the second type of uh, radar system is the continuous wave radar or CW radar. So instead of sending a pulse, uh, you will now send a CW wave at a certain frequency. Now, the uh, again, it, it will bounce off of the object, you will have an echo signal uh, returning back to you. But the received signal now will include a Doppler shift or quote unquote, the Doppler effect. Uh, that is used to determine your, the target's velocity or speed. Um, it's mostly used for vehicle speed detection. Uh, you can already imagine uh, the main application is for law enforcement, you know, police officer and his radar gun for traffic monitoring. So I mentioned Doppler shift as a way to um, determine the velocity or speed of a moving object. So let me explain that a little more. 
So uh, mentioned earlier, again, uh, that receiving signal um, is the important signal. That's where all the information will lie in terms of uh, the, the parameters that you're looking for. So if you can think back to the police officer uh, shooting his, um, his radar gun, he's going to shoot that CW wave at you. Uh, but the returning signal, if it's a moving object, the returning signal will always have some type of frequency shift. And that frequency shift is basically the Doppler effect. You know, understanding that frequency shift, knowing what that shift is, what frequency that shift is, you can calculate the velocity of that uh, moving object. Uh, so for example, if you look at the image here, this approaching uh, vehicle, as you can see that returning line or that echo signal is um, a bit different. There is a frequency shift compared to the transmission. Uh, that is where you would determine the velocity, but also you can also determine the direction of the, uh, the moving object as well. Uh, that's by taking a look at the number of wavelengths. And as you can see, if the vehicle is approaching you in your direction, uh, many more numbers of wavelengths compared to the transmission signal, many more um, uh, intervals as well, much more compact. Uh, that is that indicator. So on vice versa, uh, if the object is moving away from you, the wavelengths will be much uh, spread apart, intervals as well and of the less number of wavelengths will indicate to you that that uh, object is moving away. Uh, one other thing I must mention is for stationary objects. You know, for moving objects, the frequency shift for your, uh, will always be there on that returning signal. But for a stationary or non-moving object, that uh, returning signal will be almost identical to that transmission signal. There will be zero frequency shift. Uh, that is called the zero Doppler or zero Doppler shift, which is uh, something quite important I will get into in uh, the next couple of slides. Oh, and I must also mention here before I forget, uh, the continuous wave uh, signal in itself. Uh, since it's a continuous wave, uh, your results will always be continuous. So what that means is that uh, because it's continuous, you are able to instantaneously uh, measure the rate of change of that range or that distance. And that is how the police officer is able to just click a button and instantaneously uh, figure out how fast you are going and then instantaneously uh, write you a ticket. So moving on, let us talk about the key components of pulsed radar systems. And again, uh, today's keyword, not only is it radar, but it is pulsed. Right, so the main components here, obviously there are many more that can be added depending on the, uh, the need and application. But uh, the main components here are the first is trans the transmitter. It can be a combination of a signal source, a uh, pulse modulator, a power amplifier. Uh, and then the antenna obviously uh, can be used in many different types of antennas including phased arrays uh, to account for multiple angles and directions. Uh, and then a duplexer. Now this is um, there to allow you to use a single antenna and it will decide if that antenna can either transmit or receive a signal. Uh, then the receiving side, you have your receiver to process and detect that signal, uh, do some analyzation before it gets moved out to the output. And finally, your indicator or your display. Very obvious here, this is for the observer, the user to uh, easily understand uh, what is happening with your target object. And from the, uh, the image you see here, very simple again, um, your transmission to your duplexer, which will decide if you're receiving or transmitting. Uh, if you've received, it will receive and go to your display and, and back and forth. So since we are focusing on pulse, let us talk about the most common types of pulsed radar. So the first type or the most common is pulse Doppler radar. Now, as I mentioned before, the basic pulse uh, radar system is uh, there to really determine the range or distance of your target object. But, you know, uh, many people would also require 
the velocity or speed of that object as well. So with that in mind, uh, they have incorporated the Doppler effect, just as uh, they did with the CW radar in the uh, police radar gun. Now, incorporating the Doppler effect, now you can not, not only uh, measure the distance and range uh, with the pulses, but now the Doppler effect will give you that frequency shift back, uh, so and you can calculate the velocity of your target object. So now you have everything covered, the distance, the range, the direction, and velocity. Now, if you look at the basic block chart below of a pulse Doppler radar, uh, let me just quickly go through how uh, um, uh, the signal flows here. The CW oscillator or your signal source, uh, that's where you will be uh, producing your signal. It can be pulse modulated with the pulse modulator, uh, and then uh, the power will be added. And also make sure the levels are correct for each pulse and then be sent out to the duplexer for transmission out to the antenna. Uh, once out to the object, it will reflect back at an echo signal, and then a duplexer will then let the antenna receive the signal, be sent to the receiving system now, which is uh, includes a detector that will decide if that signal is worthy enough for detection that it has met the minimum uh, signal requirements. Uh, once it has done so, it can be analyzed and then sent to the Doppler filter. Again, uh, this is the extra component for the uh, pulse radar system to now let you determine what is that frequency shift and then calculate the velocity uh, instantaneously. Uh, one of the main applications uh, would be air surveillance, just like the, base, um, the basic pulse uh, radar. Um, if you're from the ground, you're looking at the sky, you're, you're trying to find an aircraft, uh, you've locked onto that aircraft, but now you can find not only the distance, but how uh, quickly that aircraft is traveling and at which direction it is traveling. Uh, another common uh, application, uh, many of you may already know, have heard this before, is the weather report. You know, uh, I'm sure you've heard the Doppler radar your local uh, weatherman or weather uh, woman. And this is basically the same system. Uh, instead of an, an aircraft uh, that you are looking for, uh, they are looking for a storm cloud or a, a storm activity uh, out, um, you know, miles and miles away, uh, depending on, uh, you know, how you have your pulse radar set up. Uh, the range and resolution could uh, be stretched even longer. So with this system, they are able to determine uh, how fast that uh, storm is traveling, how far that storm is away from us, and which way is it uh, traveling? Is it coming towards us or is it going away from us? And that is the way they can provide such accurate um, uh, predictions on when will this storm will uh, arrive. You know, at five of, on Friday at 5 p.m. is when uh, it'll start raining. Um, I was always uh, very curious to know how they were so per, uh, so precise. Uh, well, this is basically the reason why. Pulses uh, are very, very good in terms of uh, accuracy of range. So, uh, since we are focusing on, on pulse, let's talk about the second most common pulse radar. Uh, this is called the Moving Target Indicator Radar or MTI Radar. So as uh, the pulse is very similar to the pulse Doppler radar, but if you can imagine uh, switching the scenario, you know, for the pulse Doppler, uh, we are on the ground searching for an object in the sky at very, very long distances. Uh, but let's, if we flip that scenario, and now you are in the sky looking for a moving object uh, on the ground. Uh, let's say, for example, a vehicle. So uh, again, you're sending a signal to that target. You should receive an echo signal back and able to analyze that signal to figure out the, uh, you know, what is happening with that moving target. But in reality, uh, you may receive multiple echo signals. Uh, and that is due to environmental clutter. Uh, environmental clutter is basically things around the environment, you know, whether it is the hills, uh, buildings, mountains, terrain uh, in general. So if you can imagine a moving vehicle going through uh, different terrain and you're trying to lock onto that target, 
uh, these echo signals will come back and you must uh, determine which are from clutter and which is from the moving target. So as I mentioned before with the Doppler effect, because again, the MTI radar system also incorporates the Doppler effect. And for stationary objects, uh, there is zero frequency shift, right? Those are called zero Doppler shift uh, echo signals. So with uh, the MTI system, they have, well, you will have a component. It is called the MTI filter. And that is a schematic right below this little uh, chart you see. That is a schematic of an MTI filter or also called a double canceller. And this is where all of the zero Doppler uh, echo signals will be filtered instantaneously. Again, part of uh, this is a component that will be added to your radar system. So now that you would not have to worry about any of these um, uh, clutter signals, you can stay locked onto your moving target. So let me just take a, a quick break because um, uh, we know that this may be lunchtime for many of you uh, on the East Coast, maybe even on the West Coast. You know, I, I, I eat lunch pretty early as well. And normally we would invite you, you know, to a restaurant to do a presentation for you like this. Uh, but in today's climate, obviously, that's that's very difficult. So with that in mind, uh, and with the appreciation that you have joined us today, we will be sending you a gift card and a T-shirt. Uh, the gift card will be uh, to a local restaurant in your area. Uh, I do not know exactly which restaurant at the moment, but I can promise you that it will not be Wendy's. So let me quickly pop up a button on your screen. It should uh, also make a little bell ring, just like that. And if you click on that button, it'll take you to our contact form. All you would need to do there is uh, type in where you would like us to send you the gift card and your T-shirt. You can also add any questions that you may have. Um, and we'll uh, address that question and, of course, send you our, our gift package. I've got a sample of the T-shirts here. Very nice. We had quite a few printed for the IMS conference, but... Uh, because we're not there this week, uh, handing these out. We'd like to uh, put some of these in the mail to to our friends in the industry. So thank you for taking your time to do that. Yes, thank you, David. And as you can see, the T-shirts the are quite, uh, quite stylish, you know, <laughs> uh, very good for uh, working out or, you know, uh, showing off on, on the weekends. Okay, let me move on. That was a quick break. Let us dive into signal sources uh, really quick. This is just a general um, a list of the types of signal sources that may be available on the market. Uh, continuous wave or a uh, LO source. This is the most common, most requested. Um, the analog signal generators uh, that is can be quite common as well. Uh, has some um, analog, usually will have some analog modulation capabilities. Uh, and then, of course, the vector signal generator is capable of both uh, analog and digital modulation. The quote-unquote golden source in a lab setting is usually a high-performance CW source with very, very low phase noise uh, or an analog signal generator, again, with very, very low phase noise and some modulation capabilities. Uh, and finally, the VSG uh, that has the most functionality as it includes all of the modulation capabilities from uh, analog and digital. So let me kind of highlight here uh, a little bit about our products. I'm not going to go into every single one. Uh, we want to highlight our uh, main bench top here, the Model 865. Um, uh, the quick specs, as you can see on the right here, going up to 40 gigs, uh, 20 microsecond frequency switching time. Uh, very good for uh, antenna manufacturers and an antenna testers. Uh, and I've highlighted modulation because this is very important for radar uh, testing and radar applications. We have a suite of modulation capabilities, pulse, obviously, but, uh, you know, AM, FM, phase modulation. All of these can be used for many different types of radar signals. Uh, and possibly most important here is the excellent phase noise. You know, at minus 113, at 10 gig, 1 kilohertz offset. Uh, you will notice that is a theme of our signal sources. Uh, every single one of our offerings have uh, excellent, excellent phase noise. Now, before I move to the next slide, let me just quickly grab a Model 865 just to show you 
how different it is from a standard traditional bench top that you may already have experience with. You know, it's quite small. There's a handle on the side. Uh, you know, I'd say about the size of a lunchbox, maybe slightly bigger. And, you know, again, portable, very light, five pounds. You can move it from any location to the other or possibly even integrate it into your radar system. Um, right? You have a full control from the front panel, but we also have a GUI that is provided with all of our signal sources. And if you look at the screen, that is a snapshot of what you will see if you wanted to control the unit remotely. So the image here, uh, that, that is the GUI in itself. And as you can see, there are many different functions that you can choose. And these are the tabs that you would see. You know what, let me just kind of turn on my uh, cursor here. Hopefully you can see this. So as you can see, there are many different tabs for different functions from CW, from sweep. But again, today we're focusing on radar, so let's talk about modulation. I have that tab already clicked. And then right below, you will see the different modulation capabilities. You know, pulse, something we will be talking about today and actually showing you today on Orwell, during Orwell's demo. Uh, but again, a suite of modulation capabilities uh, very um, uh, important for radar applications, uh, including chirp as well. So let me turn off the pointer and move to the next slide. Uh, have to mention uh, our low noise microwave synthesizer. You know, this is PC control only. Again, much smaller now than the bench top. And if you can see on my screen and my camera, you know, um, Again, easily integratable into any system, or you can use this as your LO, you know, excellent phase noise CW source uh, for uh, many, many different types of applications. But again, the specs and the phase noise are all there, right? 40 gigs, uh, and this time even the power is, is, is quite good as well, plus 23 dBm across the frequency range and very fast switching speeds again. And finally, our multi-channel offerings. You know, we're very uh, proud and excited to offer these as well. They've been quite popular uh, in the market right now. We have many customers using these for uh, radar applications, but uh, many different applications. Um, specs are what you would expect, 40 gigs, going up to four channels, even eight. If you have a, a requirement there or interested in that, please do let me know. Uh, power switching, frequency switching down to 25 micro, and possibly most importantly, uh, phase coherent outputs. So with that said, uh, I believe it is time for Orwell to take over, uh, give us some uh, insight on power measurements, Ladybug, and then of course his amazing video demo. Uh, so Orwell, the floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you, Junior. That was very, very interesting. And I will have to say, before I get into my power sensors, that I've, I've really enjoyed using these uh, Berkeley nucleonic sources. Uh, the, it's nice to, to have the front panel similar to the to the um, GUI on the software. It makes, uh, it makes my demonstrations very easy. Um, so uh, we make power sensors for all different kinds of applications, but as a general rule, power sensors are used for primary standards around the world for measuring power uh, in any situation. So here's a list of typical uses uh, of power sensors. Um, the first one, calibrating other equipment, network analyzers, sources, all kinds of things are, are calibrated with power sensors. Just as an example, if you have a, a source with a calibrated output, a sensor was probably placed on that source and used to get the, the information to load into the calibration tables. Uh, and so they're, they're used quite, quite heavily for applications like that. Product development, you know, you, you can't test um, uh, your, your device and know what that output power is reliably um, without some kind of, a, of an instrument to measure that. And power sensors are very, very useful for that. Manufacturing test systems, one of our biggest market segments. These are used at the end of the production line, sometimes in the middle of the production line to make sure different modules are working properly and to make sure the device does not transmit out of spec 
uh, but it's up to the limit. For example, uh, cell phones, if you want to get that maximum range, they're tuned at the point of manufacture to get that maximum capability, but not break the law. So they're used for, for, for that kind of um, application quite often. Antenna testing, uh, extensive use of uh, power sensors for an antenna testing. Uh, the 5944 is used for that, but a good choice is also one of our pulse sensors uh, you know, um, where you can make a, a very, very fast um, uh, settled measurement, 2000 per second. So for antenna testing, where you want to sweep a lot of information and rotate the antenna or wh whatever you want to do, uh, they're, they're very useful for that. And of course, transmitter testing, um, weather radar. We have um, applications for testing of weather radar, but also we have um, several of uh, pretty large weather radar customers that actually have the sensor mounted right on the coupler on their antenna, monitoring that outbound pulse um, uh, as it heads off to the clouds to, to keep you dry on your picnic. And um, radar testing, our pulse sensors are, are great for, for different kinds of radar testing other than uh, weather radar. You can see droop and all kinds of other, uh, other things with them. Um, with a with a power sensor, defense applications. Another very very large um, uh, part of our business is uh, just various defense applications, and uh, space applications, uh, satellite applications, and and so forth. Um, so picking a power sensor can be a daunting process because if you look, you'll see every power sensor manufacturer has a myriad of choices. And so how do you pick a power sensor? Well, first is your frequency, and then you have to determine you know, what kind of signal you've got and what kind of measurement you want. So if you've got a CW signal, you can use any of our power sensors and, and get a great measurement. Now, if you look at my second image there, I've got, uh, it's it's not an actual transmission burst, but I've tried to, to make it, get an image that that's uh, kind of approximate a transmission burst. And you can take one of our, um, of our two RMS sensors and trigger it on the beginning of that burst. And it won't matter what the modulation is because a, a lot of, in the satellite business today, um, uh, it's like a bus almost that so you don't know what kind of signal is going to be uplinked to the satellite. And so you could have a really wide bandwidth uh, signal um, on your, uh, on your, in your burst. And so a good true RMS sensor that's fairly fast, but will give you an RMS representation of the signal is, is a good choice for a, a burst uh, measurement. And, and we're going to take a look at, at one of those in a video in, in just a minute. The last image there is just a typical pulse. And it, it, it'll show you a little bit about what we call pulse power. For example, we call peak power the highest power level. A lot of times that's the overshoot um, of your, on your signal. And then the pulse stop average is what we call pulse power. And then duty cycle, of course, is between the pulses. But our uh, sensors, such as the LB480A, will directly measure that um, pulse for you. In other words, you, you don't have to uh, go through a duty cycle calculation from average power. You can actually make that measurement. We can do it statistically, or we can trigger on the pulse and measure it um, uh, by scanning it. So um, um, that's just some of the some basic information about power sensors that uh, you might find useful. Average power measurements. Now that's a typical measurement that everybody wants, um, uh, and and a, our average power to RMS average sensors use uh, diodes that are operating in square law. And these diodes are modulation independent. I've mentioned that already, but even if you put a 500 megahertz modulated signal in there, it's going to just turn that into the average power of that signal. And that's a question we get quite often. So I think it's important to understand that. And uh, an RMS responding sensor, like our true RMS sensors, um, even if you can't see the pulse in there, uh, over the time of, of that signal, it's going to give you the actual RMS value. And if you go to our pulse sensors to make an average power measurement, such as uh, I mentioned for, for antenna testing, 
um, those sensors uh, return 2,000 settled measurements per second, and that's down to minus 60 dBm. So that's a pretty uh, wide range. Now, they are a modulation bandwidth limited, so you can use them for modulated signals. You just have to, to, to understand exactly what, you, what you're doing with them. But they're very useful for uh, a lot of applications uh, uh, like that. So let's take a look at a pulse signal uh, such as Junior was talking about. You've got your pulse width and your, your pulse repetition rate. And, it, it, you know, in the early days of radar, the only thing you could measure, you'd have your thermal sensor out there, you'd turn on your 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 pulse stream and you'd get your average power and then you'd take your your uh, average power and you'd divide the, the duty cycle that you, that you assumed or that you knew from your transmitter. And that's how you would get your... Um, your um, uh, pulse power. But today you can measure that directly with um, a sensor like this, like the LB480A. It will, and that's what was used to generate this image on the screen. Uh, and, and you can actually measure that uh, pulse directly. And so that's a very, um, a very powerful uh, uh, tool to use. Um, so now I think, uh, since I've jumped ahead there, I think now we'll, we'll go ahead and um, take a look at the first video. Um, sure. Uh, and then I'll come back to this uh, little additional information. Now, this first video uh, was done with this sensor. And what I did was I put 60 dB of attenuation in front of it. Now, the bottom end of the sensor is minus 60. So uh, it's I put the power right down into the noise floor. So I wanted to show you um, how you can use averaging uh, on a pulse signal. And it, and it does a couple things that I think are very useful to know. Uh, in addition to looking at the pulse aspects of the video and of the signal, you can also kind of see what a powerful tool uh, averaging is in, in microwave power measurements. So let's uh, take a look at this. Now, the, you may need to um, click uh, your mute button um, to, uh, to uh, be able to hear this video. And you if you want to full full screen it, you can use the the um, four arrows there if you need to do that. But we're going to start it up here. If you can't hear it, um, you can ping us and we'll stop it. But I think if you look for that unmute button, um, uh, you can do that. You do... OK. All right, here we go. This demonstration using a Ladybug LB480A power sensor and a Berkeley Nucleonics Model 865 source, I'm going to show you how to make high sensitivity pulse measurements. I'm using external triggering and there's 60 dB of attenuation between the source and the sensor. Okay, let's take a look at how you can use uh, averaging and some other techniques to make a high sensitivity, high dynamic range pulse measurement. Um, now, I've already showed you I've got 60 dB of attenuation between my sensor and my source. And I did that just to push the the um, power down to where I, so that I can make this demonstration. Uh, my source is, is here, it's set for five uh, gigahertz. My sensor is also set for five gigahertz. My power of my source, uh, which is the pulse stop power, um, is zero dBm. Uh, and let's take a look at the pulse that I've got set up. I've got a um, uh, 100 microsecond repetition rate and a one microsecond pulse rate. That's uh, 0 0.001 milliseconds uh, and uh, 0 0.010 milliseconds in the repetition time. And uh, let's jump over to the to the power meter here. Uh, so I've got averaging turned off and uh, the pulse is there, but you can't see it. Uh, the reason for that is it's buried in the noise. The sensor uh, is, is set to... Um, to uh, trigger on the pulse uh, internally. Uh, it's set for auto level. Uh, I could try to set it to manual level, but uh, it, won't, it won't pick it up because the noise is, is, is jumping up higher than the uh, power level is and the sensor doesn't know what to trigger on. Uh, so now I'm going to set that to external TTL. And as you saw, uh, I have a cable connected to the source's trigger output and I'll be able to trigger on the pulse. And so it will show up as um, a pulse uh, once it's um, it's pulled out by its triggering. So th so there are my uh, pulses. I've got two of them on the screen. If I want to change that, I can go to the 
to the main display and change the sweep time, but I don't really want to mess with that, but that's how you would accomplish that. Um, now, I can also zoom in on this pulse, which I am going to do, because I'll, I'll go down here in the bottom and make a couple of measurements in a second, uh, but I can zoom in on any portion of the windows with this uh, power meter. So now the, the um, signal is there, but you still can't do much with it. So we're going to turn on some averaging. So I'll put 10 averages um, in effect here. Uh, and um, I'll set up so that I can click the button to manually reset them. Now, it takes a little bit of time to make 10 averages on a trace display like this. Normally, this sensor will make about 2,000 average measurements per second, um, but here we're making traces, uh, and these traces are long, so there's many, many, many uh, points to be averaged uh, to average a trace out to, to get the noise out of the trace. And so there, it's, it's getting pretty clean. In fact, I could probably measure it now, but rather than do that, I'm going to change my averaging to uh, 100. And you'll see that it'll, um, it'll start to clean up um, even more, but it, it will take it quite a few seconds to, uh, to clean up. And while it's in the process of, uh, of doing that, I'm going to show you some other features that we have here. I'm going to enable a, a, a marker, and uh, it's just going to be a normal marker. Uh, and it's, it's marker one down here, and I'm going to set that at the top of the pulse there, and you see that it's showing its measurement point as minus 59 point some odd dBm, and we would expect to see a minus 60. Now, I do have an offset in uh, which um, oh, it doesn't show right now, but I've, ha I've got that in because I checked my attenuators. My attenuators back-to-back -back are off um, a little bit, so that offset is in there. Uh, so uh, I can also now put in a, a gate. So I'm going to put a gate, a gate A. I'm going to set that to be um, an average power gate. And I'm going to put that across the top of my pulse. And what that's going to do is that's going to average the points across the top of that pulse and giving me a, a more accuracy on what the pulse top power is, 59.62 or 63 uh, dBm. And I'm, I'm going to turn on um, uh, another um, a gate, uh, another uh, average power gate here, just so we can see what the off power is. Uh, and uh, 60, minus 67 dBm. Uh, so um, uh, there's, uh, there's that. Now, let, now, there's another way we can filter this even more using the video filters, um, which I can turn on uh, a video filter. I'm going to turn on a 1 megahertz filter. Now, it's going to mess up our, um, our uh, waveform a little bit because uh, it's... And in fact, let me turn the averaging down to 10 so you can see that more quickly. And the reason it's it's done that is because the um, the, the the rise time of the um, of the pulse uh, uh, is being filtered out by this filter. So I can still use a filter. I'm just going to step it up to five uh, megahertz, and I'll I'll get um, a, a better rendition of my pulse there, and I can make a nice measurement. If I turn my averages back up to 100. Uh, you'll see that, um, that that this is a pretty clean, um, pretty clean signal um, here, uh, and because the sensor has such a great dynamic range, and you can see we're down really low with this power measurement. You can't make this kind of a measurement with most power sensors. If you take one of our competitors sensors they advertise as pulse sensors. Uh, these sensors are up around minus 35 dBm with their lower power levels, maybe minus 40. Uh, so um, this is a really powerful uh, sensor for, for these kinds of high dynamic range measurements. Uh, now, I've, I've said high dynamic range, but here we're, we're doing high sensitivity. But this, this sensor will do a, a, a pulse just like this from minus 60 to plus 20. So um, it's, a, it's quite a nice uh, sensor, and, and um, here you can see how averaging uh, can really clean up a signal. Averaging works this way on uh, an average power measurement, too. It just it works because your signal is consistent and noise is random. And when you start averaging those random numbers together, eventually they'll average into some number which is close to your noise floor, and um, which is this number down here on the B gate. It's, it's, it's essentially the noise floor of the sensor, uh, not just the sensor, but the noise that may be coming out of the source as well. Um, but that's how averaging uh, can help you make a high dynamic range measurement. Thanks for watching. Okay, uh, so that's a, a little quick video about uh, pulse profiling measurement. 
and our product line includes um, a, a rich set of RMS uh, responding sensors. We call true RMS sensors, and we go up to 50 uh, gigahertz with those sensors, just like um, the 5944 here with option 050. And um, then we have the pulse profiling sensor, which I just showed you. In addition to that, that same sensor will perform the functions of what we call our peak and pulse sensors. Those peak and pulse sensors use statistics to uh, locate your pulse stop. They just scan a, a set of, of signal for a period of time and locate the uh, statistical points of interest on the sensor. We Our sensors do not require user zeroing because we have a patented dynamic calibration process. And so we, we calibrate our sensors across their full operating temperature range so they don't drift. And in an automated system, if you use this in an automated system, like you might use one of our competitor sensors, when that competitive sensor goes to uh, re-zero itself because the temperature might have changed, our sensor will not do that. It will just go to the calibration tables and grab the appropriate data, and you won't even uh, know what's happening. It'll just do it um, automatically. We also offer first-tier traceability, and traceability is uh, is uh, how the uh, calibration standard that was used to calibrate the sensor is handled. And our calibration standards come directly from this. In other words, our, our calibration standards, we have several. Uh, we have the standards we use every day and we have backup standards and they're sent directly to NIST, not to another Cal lab, which would send their sensors to NIST. Our sensors go straight to NIST. So that's what we call first tier traceability and not all power sensors uh, manufacturers can uh, can say that. Uh, this um, is the sensor that uh, I use to make the uh, that last measurement. And this one on the image here has a type N male on it, but uh, we we offer our customers the ability to purchase the sensor with a, a connector that'll fit directly on their dot. So you can order the sensor. A lot of people uh, like this one that I use in the demonstration, this is what a lot of customers buy if they're going to attach a cable to a sensor uh, because the SMA um, female, you put a, a cable on there and, uh, and, uh, and use that in automated systems and so forth. And so uh, there's a, a lot of uh, nice features with, with the, that uh, particular uh, <clears throat> sensor. We have uh, triggering options and uh, uh, recorder output also. And with this sensor, you can also get a, um, a, uh, an output directly off of the detector. We call it option OW2. Uh, and uh, a lot of people like that semiconductor testers. And they'll take two of these and they'll use them uh, on an amp to check the latency and the amp. And uh, I, I didn't mention droop, but it's a pretty, pretty nice to measure droop on a, on a pulse signal. Um, so, uh, so the second video that we've got here uh, is a, um, uh, it's another pulse uh, video, but it's made with a true RMS sensor. And as I mentioned before about our competitors' uh, sensitivities, uh, this sensor we advertise as minus 60, and, and that means it'll go below minus 60 in, by our specifications. But when you open the detector filters up so that you can get a, 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 a wider bandwidth, um, you introduce noise. And so that means the noise for the sensor comes up. And so with this sensor, like our competitive sensors, you're looking at um, minus 30, minus 40 on a, uh, on a wide uh, bandwidth pulse measurement. Uh, and so I've got this, um, this video set up to, to talk about how you can measure a transmission burst, which you, you might use for any number of things in, in uh, communications. Everything is in, in bursts these days. There's no more analog communications to speak of. Uh, so well, here's the video. Okay, Orwell, before you start the video, a couple questions came up, and we could wait to the end to the Q&A, but the GUI is included. Is I spoke for you, but the GUI is included at no cost with the each power sensor. Is that correct? That's correct. We don't charge for our software, and while we're on software, we are programmatically friendly. So um, uh, with all of our sensors, uh, you get a GUI for use uh, on a PC, and you also get drivers for um, uh, various kinds of software. We have, uh, I would say, over half of our business goes in automated tests. And so there's LabVIEW, there's C, there's 
all kinds of things. A lot of people use Excel Cal Labs, sometimes use Excel when they calibrate sensors. And so we have a lot of people that use, um, and those drivers are all part of what we consider tools to use our sensor, which we provide with the sensor. And we have technical support. We have uh, uh, software people available to, to help with those. And since you mentioned um, uh, uh, interconnectivity indirectly, uh, this sensor has an option that uh, has a pretty pretty good customer base uh, already. It, we, we're the only sensor that you can get a calibrated, a fully calibrated accurate power measurement um, without connecting it to a computer. So the sensor is self-contained and we have uh, access to, uh, we offer a, an S option we call SPI and it provides a little cable coming out the back that, that, that offers SPI and I2C connectivity. So we have customers talking to the to sensor from FPGAs and from various uh, microcontrollers and some fairly large customers uh, too, I might add, uh, using them in small test sets they take out in the field for testing, um, you know, military devices and things. It's such a compact unit, Orwell. Can you hold it up a little closer to the to the camera and just give sure. everybody a look? I mean, that's one of your features is the size, especially for these integrated applications. Yeah, yes. really good. And we have um, a mounting bracket, a uh, standard mounting bracket for it as well. Uh, it's, uh, it actually comes with a it's design for mounting uh, under the under a plate, uh, on a face plate, or in front of a face plate, so you can pull it out for calibration. And so uh, we have a, a, a lot of support uh, items like that. So here's the, um, the uh, um, first video. Great. Welcome. Since digital communications have taken over from analog, most information is sent in bursts. The bursts can contain audio, it can contain uh, just various kinds of modulation of data. For example, it can be uplinked to a satellite. Communication bursts contain uh, internet information, uh, video information, whatever is sent, it's going to go out in a burst. Today we're going to measure the RMS value of a transmission burst. Uh, the sensor we're going to use is a Ladybug 2RMS sensor. It's an LB5944A, covers up to 44 gigahertz, so it can be used for all kinds of satellite bands, uh, and it's going to give us a true RMS value uh, during our burst. We're going to simulate a burst using a Berkeley Nucleonics Model 865 source. Now let's take a look at the software. We've got PMA12, the power meter software for the LB5944A power sensor that we're using for this demonstration. We've got that open and we've got the um, uh, uh, Berkeley Nucleonics 865 uh, signal generator GUI open. The front panel is similar. Um, we're just going to use the GUI. It's right on the screen. It's nice and easy to use. So the first thing we're going to do is turn the frequency up to 20 gigahertz um, and we'll turn that on and you'll see it show up on the on the power sensor there. Now we're, we're set for one gigahertz, so we need to correct that, uh, change it to 20 gigahertz, so we, we're on the, using the right calibration data for, uh, for the sensor, so we measure the source correctly. You notice that's a pretty minor change, uh, and this means this is a very flat sensor. It's good for frequency hopping measurements and things like that. So it's quite a small change uh, for covering a, a, big, a big jump in frequency like that. So um, now we're going to go to the uh, trace mode. And when we do that, the sensor is going to be changed and reconfigured to a faster mode of, of uh, operation. And the video filter is going to be changed uh, to seven microseconds. And that's going to introduce some noise. So our noise floor, which was below minus 60, is now going to come up a little bit, well, quite a bit. Uh, and we'll we'll do that now. And so here we are. Now we're in trace mode, and um, you see the frequency is still 20 gigahertz, and we're still measuring uh, zero dBm. Uh, <clears throat> now we'll go down to the source, and we'll go ahead and turn on the the pulse. Uh, we'll do that under modulation. There's a lot of different kinds of modulation with this this nice source. So I've got this set to repeat every two milliseconds, but again, we're triggering on this signal. 
of this burst, the simulated burst. So the, the off time is really doesn't matter. We just want to get it off the screen and out of the way. But we can re-trigger on that pulse uh, rather rapidly. Now, there's a, a dot right here. So we've got uh, 0.3 milliseconds, which is 300 microseconds. And that's the length of the burst we're going to measure. It's a, just a simulated transmission burst, like an uplink burst or something like that. Now I'm turning on that pulse. And there you'll see it. We're going to clean that up just a little bit here. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off auto range because right now the sensor is crossing over between the high sensitivity path and the low sensitivity path. And I'm only interested in the pull stop, so I don't want to see all the noise down there. So I'm going to just switch to the upper range. And um, uh, now in order to increase my resolution, I'm going to go f to a medium resolution. And there's my um, burst. And um, I could even go to a higher resolution. But first, let's change the trace time to um, 0 to milliseconds. Um, in fact, we could even go a little lower. And then let's go to 1.5 milliseconds. Uh, so uh, we get a little bit wider pulse on there. Now the pulse is all over the screen because we're not triggering on the pulse. So I'm going to go down to triggering and I'm going to um, make sure I've got everything set right here. I got my trigger level to minus 10 dBm, which you can see is right in the middle of the range. So that's a, a good enough spot. I could also use external triggering. I do have that set up. Um, but we will switch now the source to internal triggering. So it's going to begin um, triggering on the signal itself. The sensor, when it crosses over the, the uh, minus 10 dBm threshold, it's going to issue a trigger. And um, there's the, uh, the pulse. So <clears throat> you see it's at 0 dBm like we've got set. Uh, I'm going to now um, set up a gate so that we can... Um, We've got lots of features here, gates and markers, but this is a measurement gate that I'm going to use. So we're going to come over here and we're going to bring this in. Um, and and uh, you'll see now that our gate power, which I need to make us a little bit larger on the screen here. I'll move this down so you can see the um, window there. So there's our gate power. It's marked right here, gate power, uh, 0.318. Um, 317 uh, dBm, uh, and that's the average pulse stop power. Uh, 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 and you can um, do some other adjustments here. Let's just take a look at uh, trigger delay because you see this little ramp. Now, that's a result of the sensor's um, rise time, uh, the detector filter's rise time. But we're going to take that out here with a um, 7 uh, microsecond, if I got my number right, trigger delay. It's a little long there. Um, 6. So there we go, 7 um, uh, microseconds. And now we've just about eliminated all of the rise time. And uh, there's our, our pulse stop power. Uh, and um, we can also change that to high resolution. And what resolution does, that tells the sensor how many data points to send back because the software is displaying the string of data that's coming back from the sensor representing the trace. So we've got an extra high resolution here. And you can see it's really cleaned up the pulse. Uh, the only problem with that, it takes a lot of time to transfer those data points. So it's, it's nice to say with a lower number, uh, if you can, to, uh, to make your measurements. Now, we can make a lot of other adjustments, and this can be done programmatically. I have another video that, that shows you how to set this up and make this measurement programmatically. I want to point out one more thing about this measurement. I've called this pulse top power, and it's power between the gates. This sensor has a video bandwidth of about 40 kilohertz. And your modulation, if this is an actual burst, it's going to be much, much higher than that, four or 500 megahertz maybe. And whatever that measurement is, this sensor is going to get an, give you an RMS representation of that value. It doesn't matter what the modulation bandwidth is. Thanks for watching. Thank you. That's good stuff, Orwell. Thank you very much. Um, get my microphone back down here. So uh, we have a couple more videos if there's an interest in watching those. And uh, I see there's a question about uh, uh, RSA 306B. I'll have to look that up. 
I'm not sure what that is, uh, but we can look that up and, and come back to Willie. Um, so uh, I'd also like to thank um, uh, Berkeley for having me on and um, uh, turn it over to uh, Junior and David. Yes, thank you again, Oral. That was that was great. And uh, as uh, Oral mentioned, we have two more videos. I will definitely send it uh, to all of our participants in a in a follow up email. But we were thinking, you know, after the Q and A session, you know, if you wanted to stick around, uh, we'll go ahead and play these videos and maybe have a discussion uh, uh, about uh, you know these videos or any other questions that you may have after uh, watching the videos. But uh, yeah, if you um, um, uh, do not have enough time, no worries. I will go ahead and send you uh, a copy of all the this whole presentation, including all the videos. So again, thank you for being with us. But we're not quite finished yet here. I have, just have a couple more slides that I want to uh, touch on. Um, we must mention our brand new BNC Online Academy. So uh, we actually, it's not quite brand new. We've been working on this for a few months now. We've had uh, some great feedback. Um, so we want to uh, invite you, if you haven't uh, taken a look at it yet, uh, we do have a free code. Let me go ahead and pop up another button on your screen. Hang on one second. Boom. So the code is basically the word Berkeley. It'll take you, if you click on the button, it'll take you to our online uh, BNC Academy page uh, in the portion where you can enter your credit card to pay for the course. Um, you will not need to, you can just enter in the code and you have complete access uh, to that course or any of the courses that you would like to uh, take a look at. And this is uh, what you would sort of see when you go there, right? Uh, we have many different courses available from RF boot camp to uh, phase noise measurements, uh, even basic uh, test and measurement uh, precision timing terminology and fundamentals. Uh, radiation, nuclear, again, we have courses for um, the, the whole range of solutions that we offer. So even if you aren't a, uh, uh, let's say, a nuclear physicist, uh, that course is uh, available for you. If you just have some interest, uh, please take a look. And again, what we ask in return is your feedback. You know, we're continuously trying to improve these courses, and we can't do that from without uh, feedback from our customers. So um, uh, if you do take it, please do let us know. Would you like to see any improvements, some better questions, some better quizzes? Uh, better content you know we'd love to hear it all so the, the rsa question that's that spectrum analyzer it's a usb spectrum analyzer from tektronics i remember because we had our own spec an but it's a different class of instrumentation from a power sensor so I, i'm not sure that uh, you the, the, the question about the 306b it's a it's a little usb uh square tektronic spec an and so I'm not sure it's compa it's similar to to the power sensor. Correct. It's a, if unless that's a different instrument, that's um, that's a, a spec in right. Yes, yeah. that uh, I believe that is a handheld. Yeah. Uh, or TSA. So, okay. Okay. So uh, we mentioned the academy again. Please uh, take a look and and give us your feedback there. We're pretty much done. You know, this is the end of the presentation. Uh, okay, we can. We will play those last two videos after the Q and A. If you want to stick around, um, I'll yes. go ahead and open up the dialog box so anybody who has wants to get their audio on can just click on the little microphone, uh, and they can certainly um, get in the chat boxes here and and have a conversation with us. Yes. Yeah. And so if you'd like to join, just go ahead and click your microphone your little microphone icon and uh, you know, you can come in and act directly ask us a question instead of typing it in. But um, I think uh, there are a few more questions in here. Will you post a video on Facebook or will? Yes. <laughs> okay. important, important question. <laughs> yes. T-shirts available only for us. Um, no, I think we we can send you uh, send it internationally. International, it may, Andre, no it problem. may cost more than a T-shirt itself to send it to you, but uh, again, <laughs> we appreciate you being here with us. And uh, yes, don't know I about would, the gift card though, because we would have to research your location and what a good restaurant is down there. That's right. And with the but with the IMS uh, being uh, virtual this year, we we have the T-shirts uh, avail very available. So we'd love to get rid of some of these and 
Yeah, they are pretty sporty. Javier would like pricing on the power sensor. Um, I think the best way, Javier, is if you were to just fill out your info on that contact form that I that I showed you earlier. Um, Orwell and I will definitely get back with you. You know, one of us will get back with you with a price list of, of some sort. Uh, probably both. Uh, you know, the power sensors from Ladybug and um, Berkeley Nucleonics uh, RF uh, products as well. Okay, lead times on all these products, the SIG gens are a couple weeks typically, Junior? Yeah, the, the, depending on the model and the, the options, but and typically it's about two to four weeks if it's more of a, a standard model, uh, shorter time frame. How about the power sensor lead time, Orwell? Uh, most of our sensors are in stock these days. Uh, there could be a lead time on some sensors, but as a general rule, we have a pretty good stock level uh, on our products. Okay. All right. Uh, good. So, so I think we're kind of wrapping up the Q and A stuff here. Of course, all your questions can be uh, handled in email as well. This is just a chance to talk with us. If there's any, if you want to discuss any of the points from the presentation, and we'll wait another half a minute or so, and then we'll play those other two videos, which we think are quite interesting as well. Yes. And again, I'm looking through the attendee list, uh, many overseas. So thank you for, you know, taking the time. I know it's probably a much different time zone over there, maybe late in the evening. Uh, so yes, thank you once more. Uh, I recognize some names here as well, some customers, some, some people interested. Um, so yes, uh, let us know your application, your, your questions, requirements, your concerns. Again, we are here to support and make life easier for you uh, with our solutions. Okay. Uh, Orwell, why don't you uh, talk us through the other two videos then? And if, if people drop off the uh, participant list, we understand these will be uh, available through the follow-up email. And uh, quite a large number of registrants did not uh, log in. Maybe there's some conflicts with the IMS. And so we'll make sure uh, everybody gets a copy of the entire presentation. So uh, I've, I've got two more uh, videos. Um, <clears throat> the one that's uh, we've got kind of marked as next is uh, making autonomous, me autonomous measurements. And uh, But since I just uh, um, measured a burst measurement, um, I'd like to go ahead and uh, show you the video of how you can make that burst measurement programmatically using uh, Skippy commands. And you can do this from a, a variety of, um, of pieces of software. And, and what you're going to see is the actual uh, Skippy commands. So uh, uh, we're, here we go. Remember the unmute button. Welcome. And the expand In this video, well. I'm going to show you how to make a burst measurement programmatically using a Ladybug LB5900 series power sensor. This will work for any of the 5900 series sensors from the 8 gigahertz version up to the 50 gigahertz version. I'm going to use a Berkeley Nucleonics Model 865 source. I'm going to use it to generate a pulse at 20 gigahertz, and that pulse is going to be representative of our burst um, in our signal. So here are the specifications. The signal is 20 gigahertz. The burst is 300 microseconds. There's an off time, which I'll set, but it's irrelevant because we're going to trigger on the beginning of the burst and we're going to measure the burst. So these are the commands I'm going to send to the sensor. I'm going to use the Ladybug Interactive I.O. to send these Skippy commands to the sensor and read back the response. No other software is being used and no other calculations are being done. All the returns are coming directly from the sensor. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to preset the sensor to a known condition to clear out anything else that might be in there. And then I'm going to set the frequency uh, and then I'm going to set the detector function to normal. And this is the video filter rate inside the sensor uh, after the detector. Uh, and this is its faster mode, so it's got a seven microsecond rise time uh, in this particular mode. Uh, 
I am going to set the trigger source to internal because I'm using internal triggering. Uh, and I'm going to set the trigger level, level to minus five. Um, and then I'll set the sweep time. And this is the time between the gates. Uh, and it's going to be 250 microseconds. And I could push that out a little bit to get closer to the, to the full 300 microsecond pulse. But for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm not going to do that. And now I'm going to set the sweep offset time. And this is nothing more than trigger delay. So when the, it allows for the rise time of the sensor to, to pass before you start making the measurement. So I'm going to set that to, to 10 uh, microseconds. And then I'm going to set the sensor to use a calc feed function, uh, which calculates the average power between the gates. It's going to return that to you. And that's, again, an RMS value. Uh, re so regardless of your modulation bandwidth, if you put a 500 megahertz modulated signal in there, it's going to give you the two RMS uh, value of that signal. Um, and after that, I'm going to start issuing fetch commands to the sensor. And the fetch just uh, waits for the trigger and returns the measurement. Okay, let's make the measurement. Uh, I've got the uh, GUI for the source open, and I've got the interactive I.O. for the sensor open. Uh, and we are um, going to set up the sensor first here. So the first thing I like to do with the interactive I.O. is to send a star, star IDN command. Um, it's a query with a question mark after it. And these are all Skippy commands. And during this uh, little presentation, all of the processing is done inside the sensor. So our measurements return directly from the sensor. No processing is done in this software. And all of this can be done with other software. You can, you can access the sensor programmatically. You can use a SPI cable uh, with, our, with our direct connectivity option, or you can talk to it from, from C or how, however you like to program. Um, we, we, uh, we're, we're programmatically friendly. Um, so let's get started with our commands. Uh, first thing we'll do is we'll send a system preset default um, to, to return the sensor to uh, a default uh, condition. Then we'll set the frequency, uh, which I've got it here in gigahertz. You could set it as 20,000 megahertz. Sensor doesn't really care. It takes either. Um, We'll set the detector function to normal. Now this is the um, video filters after the detection diodes. Uh, and this, this sets them to, I have about a 40 kilohertz video bandwidth, a seven microsecond rise time. Uh, and again, these are true RMS responding diode detectors. And regardless of your signal's modulation bandwidth, it's going to return the um, RMS value uh, of that power uh, uh, level. So we're going to use internal triggering. So we'll set the uh, trigger source to internal. And as you can see, I've been playing with external too. It makes no difference uh, in reality. I just uh, uh, have it set this way. We'll set the trigger level to minus 5 dBm. Uh, these are all, this is dBm. The, the, most of the settings are in dBm. And so um, now the sweep time, uh, we want to 250 microseconds. Now we could we could send 275, or we could try to grab more of the uh, of the burst. Um, but I'm just going to grab the heart of it for this uh, demonstration. I'm not going to worry about um, you know pushing pushing my way to the edges. Uh, so now the sweep offset time, this is a trigger delay. So when the trigger is issued, the the sensor is still. Um, a, a, the, the, the rise time has not fully completed, so we want to delay our measurement just a little bit to account for that. So we'll put in 10 microseconds. We could, uh, we could push that down a little bit if we wanted to, but for the purposes of this demonstration, uh, that's adequate. Now, um, we're going to send um, a calc feed command. And what this does is this tells the sensor to take everything between our gates all those measurements between our gates, average them together, and return one to our MS uh, value uh, um, average power level on that. And so with that, the sensor is set and it is ready for this fetch command. But if we send it now, it's going to time out. And the reason is we don't have any power. We, have, we don't have the source enabled. So I have it set up here. We'll just take a quick look at it. I've got it set for 20 gigahertz and uh, plus 10 dBm, uh, which should be about the top of the pulse <clears throat> level. And um, let's look at the pulse, which I've got it set for. There's a little dot in here. So it's um, 
0.3 milliseconds, which is 300 microseconds. And then I've got a repetition time of 40 milliseconds, which is really irrelevant um, um, uh, because we're, we're triggering on the pole, so we don't really care what the off time is. Um, so we're going to turn on the uh, power and the modulation, and we'll send our fetch. And uh, there is the um, um, average power during the burst. And you can just repeatedly um, send that. When, when, you, when you issue the command fetch, uh, it waits for the trigger and makes the measurement, returns it to you. Uh, and so there you go. And you can change the settings and, and access this from uh, a lot of different software, even Excel if you, if you so chose, choose. Um, hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Okay, that's the uh, <clears throat> the video on um, major making the uh, 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 burst measurement programmatically. The commands, by the way, for the for our pulse sensors here, the uh, it's a different set of commands. This uh, the sensor we're using in the last video uses Skippy commands, standard Skippy commands like you'd use on um, any uh, Rody or Keysight sensor. The exact same command sets. Uh, are used. Now, the last video is uh, something that's uh, quite unique. Uh, the sensor has um, a very large flash memory internally, and it all, is all self-contained, which means it, it'll, it can make the measurements with uh, no, nothing but power applied. And we have an option that allows you to do certain things with the sensor under those conditions. And this video uh, is designed to, uh, to allow you to do that. So you would set the sensor up. And in the video, I'm using the USB um, uh, connectivity at all times, but you don't have to do that. I could unplug it, plug it into a, even a, a USB battery, which I do at the show sometimes to show people the, the features. So um, here, here's the video. Today, I'm going to demonstrate Ladybug's unattended operation feature. This is option UOP, which is available on any Ladybug LB5900 series power sensor. The option allows you to make unattended measurements with only power applied to the sensor. These measurements are stored internally in the sensor. We're going to use a Berkeley Nucleonics Model 865 source for this demonstration. Now I'm going to show you how to make basic unattended uh, measurements using the uh, Ladybug LB5944L power sensor and its unattended operation uh, uh, feature. Uh, this sensor covers 9 kilohertz to 44 gigahertz, uh, which is a pretty broad frequency range. But you can make this measurement with any LB5900 series product that has option UOP on it. We're going to make this measurement at 40 gigahertz because the sensor has the capability and the source we're using has the capability. We're using a Berkeley Nucleonics Model 865 uh, power source. It's, it's a very nice signal generator. Uh, the front panel uh, on, the, on the device is easy to use and it also has a nice GUI which I've got on the screen right now and I've been using. They look similar and so uh, it's really easy to go back and forth between them. Uh, this source has a lot of uh, flexibility. I'm going to go ahead and set it to uh, 40 gigahertz um, so uh, we can make our measurement at that frequency. I'm going to turn the power on. Uh, I'm going to jump over to the sensor and I'm going to change that to 40 gigahertz. But before I do that, I want you to notice that um, uh, where the power level is, it's uh, right at 40. It's 40.5 dBm. Uh, now I'm going to change the um, uh, frequency to uh, 40 gigahertz. So I've just changed the calibration uh, for the sensor from 1 gigahertz to 40 gigahertz, and we got a very, very small change in power level. Now, if you've used a lot of power sensors, you know that means the sensor is very, very flat across frequency. So if you're making frequency hopping measurements or anything where where you uh, can't change the frequency and, and it might change a little bit on you, this is a really an excellent sensor to, to use for that. So um, we're all set there. I am I'm going to change my averages to five um, just so we can get a quicker settling, even though it's it's not really necessary. But up at minus 20 dBm, we're, we're going to be working. Uh, we really don't need a lot of averages. So if I was down at minus 50 or 60, I would increase that so we would mitigate the noise a little bit. Now I'm going to jump back over to the, to the source here, and I'm going to go to the sweep. And the reason I'm sweeping is because we're going to be using an antenna operation, and I'm going to store the, the measurements. And I just want to show 
you um, something. So I'm going to set up a power sweep, store it uh, in unattended mode so you can um, see how it, how it works. So I'm going to be sweeping from minus 20 dBm to plus 20 dBm. I've got it set uh, with 100 data points, so it's going to be a pretty pretty smooth line unless you zoom in on it. And then uh, it's going to got a dwell time of 200 milliseconds per point. Uh, it's got an automatic leveling control, which the sensor has uh, automatic leveling on the output, which is a nice feature. So now I'm going to turn on the uh, sweep, and you'll see it show up on the power sensor's um, uh, strip chart, uh, sweeping from minus 20 to uh, plus 10. Uh, now I'll jump up and start in on the unattended um, operation. Now we're using the uh, PMA-12 power meter software to control the sensor. We could do this programmatically, uh, but it's just easier for a demonstration unless it's specifically about uh, programmatic control to, to use the software. So I'm going to set the sensor to uh, UOP, putting it in, mo in that mode. And it's really the software that's in the mode. Uh, it's just preparing to send commands for unattended operation. It's all ready now. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is going to go into the manage UOP. And I'm going to clear the memory. Now, it's not really necessary because if you make multiple uh, measurement sets, for example, if you've got it set up to make remote measurements and you uh, depower it and repower it and depower it and repower it multiple times, it'll just store those as separate blocks of data. And each measurement is time stamped with a very accurate uh, time base, which, which is in the sensor. Uh, and it is uh, backed up with a, a super cap. For, uh, so it's got several days worth of storage before you lose the clock. And all the memory is is, is, is non-volatile, so it'll be there for a year or, or longer. So now I'm clearing the memory in the sensor. I get the warning that I'm erasing it. So when, we're, when, our, when we stop the, the measurements, it will be only one data set in the sensor. So now we're ready. So now I go to the Start UOP dropdown, and you'll see there's two points here, Save Data and Do Not Save Data. I'm going to start the unattended operation and the, saving the data to memory, and while that's occurring, I'm going to tell you why we have the other uh, choice there. So now the uh, UOP is in progress, which means um, the sensor storing the measurements. Um, the reason we have do not store measurements is we have uh, a calibrated analog output uh, capability on the sensor. So it's a, we call it recorder out, and it's a fully calibrated output that you can scale uh, to, to whatever your needs might be, zero to one volt. Um, and that's that output can be run with no computer attached and no user intervention. Once it's set up, it's just like UOP um, in that uh, you don't need to do anything. You just apply power and it starts working. And so we have that set up so that um, uh, when you go in here, you don't have to continually write to the memory and, uh, and use the memory unnecessarily. So now I'm going to halt the UOP. Um, and uh, we're then going to collect that data back. And I'd like to point out that you can store 50 million uh, measurements in the sensor, uh, and these measurements are currently being made at one, uh, uh, one millisecond apart. That's the default rate unless it's changed. And uh, I'm now going to retrieve that data that we, we just made. And so here it is, and I'm going to tell it to, re to uh, bring back in the maximum uh, amount of data, which is everything. Uh, and, uh, and, and if we had many, many measurements in there, we could pick which, which set we wanted, and that's the purpose of, of that previous screen. So here is the, um, the, the data that, that came back in, and you see there's an index, a date, and a time, uh, and a power level. And uh, now I can store this and open it in Excel. I can do whatever I want with it. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to send it to a new strip chart. And this strip chart will be just like the one we uh, were using before we had uh, the, the um, measurement storage turned on. And so here is what was stored um, in the uh, uh, unattended uh, mode. Uh, I can zoom in on that. Um, and uh, see uh, each 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 little spot there is a data point, uh, and um, it'll it'll do this for days and days and days. Store it, and you just collect it back when, when, whenever you want it. Very useful for um, uh, a lot of operations, field operations, where you just want to monitor the power and and bring it back in and collect it. I hope you found this video useful, and thanks for watching. Real good, Orwell. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, David. Okay. That was great.
Um, should we unmute the microphones and see if there's any discussion to items? Uh, sure. Okay. Great. So everyone's pretty much live. And again, I know Junior and I and Orwell, thank you all for taking the time. We're happy to go a little further with any final Q&A. Yes. Any questions? And if you want to directly ask us a question, you can just click on your microphone icon and uh, we can hear you in real time. Looks like we're okay. Okay. Oh, well, I see uh, George is trying to type a question, I think. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's been a very long. We tried to get yes. Good an night, hour George. Yeah, it, you're in Germany, right? It's been a little bit longer right? than we had hoped, but uh, I think we covered some valuable details. I think the recording uh, will be valuable as well. Um, I'll go ahead and stop the recording now. Uh, Thank you.